Welcome to Capital Beat, a joint production between the Vermont Press Bureau and Orca Media. I'm Joshua Gorman. Joining me is Press Bureau Chief Neil Goswami. It is Tuesday, May 10th, and this is the final episode. We're going to do a wrap-up of what happened with the legislative session. We're going to talk about the budget. We're going to talk about marijuana. We're going to talk about independent contractors and everything else that came up. And so to begin, Neil, uh, yeah. a lot of Durham and Strang coming out to <laughs> nothing with this uh, pot legalization. Tell us how it things did. went and how things ended up. Yeah, so we'll, we'll do a quick recap of last week. Um, mm -hmm. Lawmakers worked pretty late into the night on Friday, uh, wrapping up their, their business, voting on money bills after, I guess it was around 10 o'clock or so. Um, they then, leaders who are leaving uh, their positions, House Speaker mm -hmm. Shap Smith, Senate Pro Tem John Campbell, Lieutenant Governor Phil Scott, and Governor Peter Shumlin all addressed uh, lawmakers at the close of business, and they finally gaveled the session out right around 12, 20 or so on uh, Saturday morning. Mm -hmm. So the legislative session is officially over. Mm -hmm. um, we are going to have a very new look and feel next year with a new speaker, new pro tem, and new governor, and new lieutenant governor. This is the first uh, time this has happened in quite some time, uh, right? It's, yeah, most people can't recall when there was right. such a, a historic turnover of leadership positions at the state house or in state government. So uh, it'll be interesting for us in the media. It'll be interesting for voters and it'll be interesting for other lawmakers uh, when they return next year to see uh, who is in charge and sort of who claims the the power base here mm -hmm. um, you know Shap Smith has been a very effective and powerful speaker mm -hmm. um, and he seemed to have sort of uh, more sway over legislative affairs than the Senate pro tem John Campbell um, and early in his tenure Governor Shumlin was more powerful, and we saw that sort of wane over the years. Mm -hmm. um, now in his sixth year, he was uh, not as effective as he hoped to be, and we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through the issues. So uh, kind of exciting and a little bit uh, unnerving for a lot of people as we move into a new era of state government as these four gentlemen uh, go off to uh, different things. Uh, as you mentioned, one of the issues that lawmakers tried to tackle this year was uh, legalization of marijuana for recreational use. Uh, we've talked a lot about that on this program before, and it's been talked about uh, on lots of programs mm -hmm. out there, but there was no sort of last uh, ditch effort or trick up their sleeve to get marijuana legalization over the finish line. The Senate, as everyone knows, passed uh, S-241. It created a uh, legalized retail market for marijuana. I think it had 54 retail outlets throughout the, uh, the state that it would have been, uh, that would have been permitted under the bill. Uh, but the House never really warmed to that position and really didn't warm up to anything at all regarding mm -hmm. legalization. They, they didn't agree to that proposal. They tried to pass a study commission um, to, uh, or, the, or the House Judiciary Committee amended the Senate bill to include a study commission on the issue that would report back to the legislature. Uh, even that didn't make it through to the end. Um, a final compromise that the Speaker and Democratic leadership in the House tried to put forward was uh, decriminalization um, for the possession and cultivation of up to two marijuana plants. That also failed on the Senate floor. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was a 70 to 77 vote. Mm -hmm. The Senate plan, which finally did get a vote on the, on the House floor, failed miserably, 121 to 28. Mm -hmm. um, this was something that Governor Peter Shumlin really wanted. He pushed for it. Um, he worked the final weekend before the voting took place. Uh, his administration worked to find the votes, and Shaft Smith had been warning him and other advocates that the votes weren't there and it mm -hmm. shouldn't come to the floor for a vote because mm -hmm. it would go down miserably. Uh, but they kept pushing for that vote, and uh, and they got it, and it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. It turns out Shep Smith was right. So, you know, one of the things that Shep said uh, to us going into the weekend <coughs> before that vote, <coughs> excuse me, is that uh, he didn't want to see a vote because he was worried it was going to possibly set back right. uh, the efforts. Do you think the overwhelming drubbing that the bill received in the House is actually set back the cause for legalization going into the next session? You know, I'm, I'm not so sure about that. This conver the conversation around the legalization of marijuana was certainly advanced this year. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no question that the conversation now is about how and when, not if, to legalize marijuana. So if you are an advocate of uh, legalization for recreational use, that has to be 
a positive step forward. Um, and the, there's a joint legislative committee, Judicial Oversight Committee, that has agreed to hold, I think, six meetings over the summer and fall to figure out how to move this issue forward, which is a real, which is also a real step forward for advocates, because uh, the House was very, very reluctant um, to to even consider this issue this year. House Judiciary Committee Chairwoman uh, Maxine Grad, uh, a Democrat from Moortown, didn't even want to take this up after the Senate sent it over, and, but she did so reluctantly with uh, urging from uh, the Speaker. So. The fact that there's a joint House and Senate Oversight Committee that will talk about this over the summer mm -hmm. to figure out how to move it forward, is a, it's a good thing. Um, I'm sure advocates are very disappointed they couldn't get something more concrete, even the decriminalization of two plants, but uh, at the very least they have some, some momentum and some positive aspects to take forward into 2017, which I'm sure will, uh, this will come up again. Absolutely. And I would say the opposition to uh, marijuana actually manifested itself on, in the form of a counterattack with uh, <clears throat> law enforcement uh, advocating and almost getting a uh, roadside saliva test, right? Yeah, that was that was an interesting thing. And, and, and people like the ACLU of Vermont, Alan Gilbert, the outgoing executive director there, uh, raised some very serious concerns about that, and it didn't pass. Uh, and I'm, I, you know, it's, it's probably a good thing that didn't pass. It seemed like there were a lot of uh, scientific and legal questions around um, the, you know, how effective this testing was and whether or not it actually could prove that somebody was impaired mm -hmm. on the roads when w after smoking marijuana, uh, given the questions about how long it stays in your system, mm -hmm. how effective the, uh, the testing is, and, uh, and also what the legal ramifications are, whether it could be used simply t for probable cause or as uh, a piece of evidence against somebody who was stopped and believed to be driving under the influence of marijuana. So in the end, that was pulled out of uh, uh, bills that were that were moving ahead, and, and they opted not to do that. Um, we should say there was some positive developments on the on the uh, medicinal marijuana front. Uh, the the legislature agreed to include glaucoma and. Uh, chronic pain as conditions that would qualify you for medical marijuana and that allows you to possess and grow marijuana legally if you have if you are registered with the state um, and they also shorten the time frame that you have to work with your doctor to uh, to be eligible so um, in that sense the medical marijuana stuff did move forward the recreational use uh, will be another conversation for next year I see yeah. good yeah uh, there were a couple other uh, judicial reform stuff that yes. that uh, sort of wrapped up at the end of the year. There were uh, few. There were a handful of bills that were sort of uh, the House and Senate were angling over and holding up in hopes that their priority would also advance. In the end, they were able to uh, pass a reform of uh, driver's license suspensions. Mm -hmm. uh, Chittenden and, Wind and Windsor counties have. Uh, held license restoration days where people who have really old, uh, outstanding traffic fines were able to go and settle them at a very reduced rate. And uh, the governor asked lawmakers to do that on a statewide level um, so that people who are constantly driving around with suspended licenses and accumulating more and more fines that mm -hmm more than likely they will never be able to pay or never just or just never pay. Uh, they'll be able to, to settle those and, and become a legal driver again. Uh, so House and Senate negotiators were finally able to determine that uh, tickets issued before July 1st, 2012 will be eligible for uh, this program that'll allow them to uh, to get their license back at a, at a far cheaper rate. Um, and there was another bill that Senator Dick Sears, the chairman of uh, the Judiciary Committee, really, really wanted was uh, reforms to how youth offenders are dealt with in the uh, criminal justice system. Uh, the, the legislation will raise the age to 22 uh, for youth offenders who can be referred to the Family Division of Criminal Court, which, uh, as, we, as people might know, is confidential and would protect their records from public scrutiny. Um, so, you know, all those college kids who do something uh, silly mm -hmm. while they're at school and they may face a criminal charge, they can now be referred to the family division and, and have their records protected as they go on to graduate and grow up and move on to the real world and, and look for a job. So uh, those were a couple of uh, pretty significant 
reforms that will probably have some pretty long-lasting impacts on a lot of Vermonters that, uh, the, that uh, the Judiciary Committees in both chambers were quite happy and proud of. Excellent. So uh, the DLS reform was one of Shulman's priorities that he outlined during his final State of the State address, and that was right. a victory that he got. Uh, yeah. One thing that he did not get that he pushed for all session was a call for divestment from uh, fossil, right. fossil fuels. That's correct. Uh, so tell, tell us about how that ended up, I guess, not happening. It's still, I mean, it, it, I suppose it could happen, but it won't be a result of legislative action as mm -hmm. the governor called for back in January. He wanted uh, legislation that would have the state automatically divest itself from mm -hmm. coal and uh, fossil fuel stocks. Mm -hmm. um, the lawmakers were not real, not going to do that. Mm -hmm. They simply, uh, you know, said no, thank you. And uh, the governor is now working sort of with uh, state treasurer Beth Pierce and uh, an investment committee that sort of helps her make decisions on how state funding will be uh, invested. State money is invested. So there's a subcommittee now looking at this issue, and they may or may not decide sometime in the future to divest, but mm -hmm. uh, it won't be this sort of automatic thing that the governor had hoped to get through legislation. Um, you know, and there's Treasurer Beth Pierce has been opposed to divesting from these stocks, mm -hmm. saying that she has a fiduciary responsibility to mm -hmm. do what's best for taxpayers and retirees that count on uh, mm -hmm. this money being invested wisely. and. Um, you know, there was a lot of back and forth all session long. There were a lot of divestment supporters uh, wandering the halls of the state house working the issue. Uh, but in the end, we'll have to wait and see what this committee uh, decides to do. And um, it was something that uh, another thing that the governor couldn't pull across the finish line this year. Yeah, and, and to be clear, the Vermont Pension Insurance Committee has voted numerous times in recent years uh, to commit to not divest. Right. So right. I don't know if we're, if we're expecting some sort of change of heart here or some sort of change in leadership. Is that what it's going to take, you think? I, uh, probably more a change in leadership <laughs> than a change of heart. Yeah. Uh, it's not, you know, it's hard to say what a what a group independent group like that might do, but mm -hmm. it just seems to me that it's something that they've been unwilling to do in the past. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not sure all that has changed uh, to to sort of uh, send them in a new direction. Lovely. Yeah. So you uh, you've been doing some wrap up stories on a couple of issues. Mm -hmm. um, independent contractors was something that got a lot of ink this year, mm -hmm. and it turned once again into a whole lot of nothing. Yes. Fill us in on on that process. Sure. Well, um, you know, people there's uh, very few people would say that the current independent contractor laws that exist that define what an independent contractor is mm -hmm. are clear and easy to understand. Um, for employees, employers, and for enforcement agencies with the Department of Labor. Um, they currently have a series of, of tests, uh, including uh, are you performing what they call so-called like work? Uh -huh. Meaning uh, if you are an employer and you have employees that are Say you have a landscaping company or something, and uh, mm -hmm. you have people who are cutting cutting grass or something like that. Then you can't bring in people who do the exact same job, but then just treat them as in independent contractors. Right. And so, uh, folks are saying that, uh, hey, this is really stifling development in Vermont's growing tech sector. That uh, that these high tech companies should be able to bring in independent contractors when when they need to, if they're working on projects that might be of a limited scope and not something that's ongoing. Mm -hmm. um, so, folks have been trying to. Find so the uh, House Committee on uh, Commerce and Economic Development spent most of the first half of the session, I think some of the second half, uh, working on a bill to redefine how independent contractors would be defined. Right. And uh, this bill came out with uh, un universal um, support, a vote of 11-0 out, yeah. of, out, out of the committee. And uh, when it came time to bring it up on the House floor, House Speaker Shap Smith said, I don't think this is ready right now. Uh, he was afraid there's going to be a uh, fight with the <coughs> government operations folks. Mm -hmm. And he saw that it was not, he believed that he was not going to have a lot of support in the Senate. And so he actually asked that the bill be re recommitted. And this was a real blow to folks such as uh, Corey Parent and yeah. um, Heidi Sherman, right. who serve on that committee and who were really, really pushing for this, this to happen. So they went ahead and they, they, they took it back and uh, they worked on the bill and the bill appeared to die. 
and then uh, just magically it was res resurrected with like a week left in the session. Uh, Kurt Wright asked that that committee be relieved of the bill, and uh, they gonna, they're going to bring it up on the floor. And so that kind of pushed the issue, and they said, okay, we need to come up with some something that's going to right. make it different from the bill that we didn't have. And so uh, Representative Mary Hooper from right here in Montpelier came up with uh, compromise amendments that uh, barely got out of committee with like a 6-5 vote, right. and only with a positive vote of somebody who ended up opposing it. Uh, <laughs> that would be uh, Representative Michael Mar Marcotte. Mm -hmm. The vice chairman yeah, of the committee. The yeah. vice chair who voted in favor of it just to bring it to the floor, even though he didn't, didn't, didn't support the bill. And so uh, this bill ended up uh, dying. And uh, for folks who are really uh, gung ho to uh, reform the way that uh, independent contractors are defined, this was right. this was a tough loss. And the way it died was interesting as well. It was a motion from uh, Representative Chris yes. Pearson, yes. a progressive from Burlington, who mm -hmm. who uh, re, you know made a point of order that it should go to I think with the Ways and Means yes. Committee. Yes, yeah, right, because there yeah. was going to be an impact on the state's unemployment insurance right. uh, fund, and so it's going to have economic impact. It should go to Ways and Means. Yeah. And so yeah, with this procedural move. Uh, it effectively killed the bill for, right. for this With session. Left not enough time for it to, to sort of come back and mm -hmm. be on the calendar again. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, very interesting. I think there were a lot of people who, who felt like they were going to actually be able to get this done. It's been an ongoing question for years, and uh, once again, it came up short. Mm -hmm. um, there was one big victory that the governor can claim mm -hmm. this year, mm -hmm. uh, paid sick leave. Yes. And uh, that seems like... So long ago now. It does. Uh, but they did get that done this mm -hmm. year. Yeah, and it, it was a long road, for sure, to make, make this happen. Uh, the paid sick leave bill passed the House during the 2015 legislative session. And uh, they went ahead, and then the bill went over to the Senate. And uh, there was much debate, what form should this thing take? What changes are they, are they going to make? And uh, in the end, the Senate ended up approving the bill no fewer than twice mm -hmm. uh, through some interesting procedural chicanery. Uh, the bill in, in Initially passed. Never a shortage of that. No, <laughs> no, there, there wasn't. So, so the bill initially clear, cleared the Senate, and what the bill called for was uh, employers, and so, so workers who work in places with at least five employees or more mm -hmm. uh, would accrue as many as three paid sick leave days uh, beginning in 2018. Yeah. Um, so the bill cleared, cleared the Senate, and then uh, Senator Bill Doyle out of Washington County uh, the following day asked to reconsider his vote. Um, mm -hmm. And since he had been on the winning side, Side, he was allowed to do that. Um, and so what that did is it brought it up again and it allowed Senator Brian Campion out of Bennington in to introduce an amendment that would have made a larger carve out mm -hmm. for uh, small employers um, so that there were basically the net result would be there would be fewer employers yeah. on, on, the, on the smaller end who would have to provide paid, paid sick leave. Right. And so uh, this was certainly a contentious issue and uh, Campion's amendment was ultimately defeated and it was defeated uh, with an affirmative vote or, or I should say, a vote against it from his fellow county senator, uh, Dick Sears, right. went ahead and switched his vote because he <laughs> was upset about Bill Doyle switching his vote. Yeah. Um, and so in the end, the Campion <laughs> Amendment was defeated, and they substituted an amended, an amended, amended version. Yeah. And what that does is it calls for a study to look at what the economic impacts are going to be mm -hmm. for employers having to provide paid sick leave. Right. Uh, Senator Joe Benning said, hey, we should have had the study before we're passing this yeah. thing, as opposed to studying the impacts after it's already been imposed. But that's what ended up happening. Um, so yeah, this is uh, definitely a, vic a victory for uh, folks who are really uh, advocates for labor. You know, it follows mm -hmm. the raise in the minimum wage that came. Right. Um, so yeah, if you're a small worker, I suppose, or a low, low, low paid worker, this is going to be a, a, good, a good thing, thing. for you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, another another thing that happened early in the session that. Mm -hmm. uh, seems to be almost forgotten about now was the tweak to Act 46, the mm -hmm. school governance law. Um, what, what was that all about and why, why did they act with such haste to get that done? Yeah, I mean, some people would argue that there wasn't enough haste taken. <laughs> um, so what happened, so Act 46 uh, is the big bill that calls for the uh, merger of smaller school districts into mm -hmm. larger school districts. Right. And uh, the advocates of this say that, hey, this is going to, among other things, uh, save money because it's going to provide for some measure of efficiency. Of Efficiency among mm -hmm. uh, school school districts. So, right. You know, you're going to be able to uh, purchase things on a larger scale, and you know, it's going to be a, a good thing. But. 
they realize that it's going to take years. Literally, uh, this thing's supposed to be done by 2020, so it's going to take years to potentially find any savings. Right. So they imposed this uh, two-year spending cap or I should say uh, spending th thresholds, you can exceed them. And so these thresholds are based upon, they're, they're individual and they're based upon how much a school district spends mm -hmm. compared with the statewide average. So if you're a low spending district, you're gonna have a higher threshold as opposed to if you're a higher spending district. And so what happened was uh, last fall, um, all these uh, school boards uh, and these uh, sc school districts went ahead and they started making their budgets and they're like, man, we cannot stay under these thresholds. And uh, part of the larger reason is because they were hammered with this this 7.9% uh, increase in health insurance costs. Mm -hmm. um, I can tell you when the bill was being uh, drafted and the spending thresholds were uh, put in, it was kind of at, at the last minute and there wasn't a lot of consideration for things like, hey, what if we have a giant uh, in increase in the cost of health insurance? They were just kind of, the mm -hmm. thresholds were just kind of arbitrarily tossed in there. Yeah. And so what happened was uh, lawmakers had to wrestle with, okay, what are we going to do? And uh, Republicans said, hey, leave them in place. It's supposed to hurt. Right. Uh, as, as we were told, this is supposed to be difficult. You're supposed to make really tough cuts. This is supposed to be painful. Mm -hmm. um, however, in the end, um, lawmakers came back for a special session uh, early on a Saturday morning on January 30th to go ahead and change the thresholds. And so what this allowed them to do was to meet the January right. 31st deadline for school districts to warn their budgets. And so lawmakers went ahead and patted themselves on the back going, hey, look at that, we made it. But in reality, school districts had already created their, their budgets right. with the thresholds in mind. So the idea that somehow they, that the school boards uh, were able to go ahead and make all these adjustments, mm -hmm. I mean, they really had 24 hours to do it. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Yeah, they went ahead and did it, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. So much ado about nothing, perhaps. Well, I mean, it was a good thing, but uh, yeah. you know, it was a sort of sort of thing that maybe should have been thought about when they were first doing the thresholds in the first place. Yeah. Uh, so they went ahead and uh, changed the thresholds for this school, the, the, the budgets that people voted on in March, mm -hmm. and they went ahead and got rid of the thresholds for next year all altogether. All yeah. Okay. Uh, we mentioned in earlier that in a lot of ways this was a difficult year for Governor Shumlin, and he's seen his sort of uh, political sway uh, diminish over the years as he's been governor. Um, one of the things, another one of the things that failed to, that he failed to pull through this year was a dedicated funding source for Medicaid. Mm -hmm. uh, last year, people will recall, he tried to push the uh, 0.7 percent payroll tax, mm -hmm. which would have raised about 100 million dollars, including federal funding for uh, the state's Medicaid program. This year, after he was rebuffed by lawmakers on that, he returned with a plan to expand the health care provider tax. Right now, uh, hospitals and the doctors they employ face a six percent assessment on their services mm -hmm. uh, that they pay to the state that helps fund uh, health care initiatives. The governor in January proposed expanding that to independent doctors, those outside a hospital umbrella, mm -hmm. and dentists at, a, at about a half, three, around three, under 3%, three about half of what they charge mm -hmm. the hospitals and hospital doctors. Uh, it would have raised $17 million. Mm -hmm. Again, lawmakers said no, and they didn't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, they ended up passing a, uh, a fee bill this year that raises $27 million. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest chunk comes from raising mutual fund registration fees, $24 million. Mm -hmm. And lawmakers argued that most of that money, almost all of that money, is coming from people out of Vermont. So mm -hmm. it won't really impact Vermonters at all. They passed a smaller fee bill, uh, I think that was, or excuse me, tax bill, that was maybe $3 million or so. Mm -hmm. um, the, the Senate stripped out a bank franchise tax, a, an expansion of the employer assessment to really bring down that tax bill and focus on raising money through fees. And then they, they wrapped up the budget as well Friday, late Friday, um, 5.76 billion total spending. Mm -hmm. I think it was about 2.45 uh, mm -hmm. billion in state funds. Mm -hmm. um, any surprises to you in, in any of these money bills? Um, surprises. Uh, no, yeah. I guess I, I well, I, I mean, surprises in that uh, by, the, by the time it was all said and done, we all knew where we were going to be going, yeah. I suppose. There was really no, last year we saw a lot of shuffling back and forth mm -hmm. between, in, for private meetings between uh, the speaker, the pro tem, and the governor, mm -hmm. as they really had some major differences over how to raise money. Mm -hmm. uh, this year, it seemed like it was a much smoother process. Yes. They weren't really 
uh, arguing a whole lot over over the money bills. Mm -hmm. um, one of the bigger issues, I guess, was the uh, renewable energy siting bill mm -hmm. that had some hangups in the end. Uh, the bill tries to give uh, local communities more uh, say in this and where these projects, wind projects, solar projects, can mm -hmm. be put in their communities. Uh, but the big thing, the big holdup at the end of the session. Uh, which sort of leaked into Friday evening to everyone's surprise was mm -hmm. um, how noise standards for wind turbines would be uh, uh, would be handled. And they finally agreed that they would go through an emergency rulemaking process with the Department of Public Service um, until they could go through the more formal rulemaking process. And that seemed to uh, mm -hmm. uh, be enough to get everyone on the same page and, and agree to move forward with eventually creating some sound standards mm -hmm. for these things that. A lot of people claim they can hear when yeah. uh, when they're up near their homes. So. Yeah. Do you think this satisfied the folks in the yellow vests who were uh, the, these <laughs> the folks who were at the at the state house who were at times I wouldn't say packing the gallery, yeah. but certainly making themselves yeah. Vis they were certainly visible. visible. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think it does for now. I think the 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 rulemaking process in which they actually set the sound standards is going to be the new battlefront, and I'm sure they will. Uh, make once again make themselves a very visible presence there, mm -hmm. uh, and try to influence that process. So uh, hopefully it moves the state forward in in how and when and where mm -hmm. these energy projects can be uh, can be built. Uh, I think everyone generally agrees that renewable energy is is good for the state. Um, there's some questions about what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. So uh, hopefully this can uh, can move the conversation forward. Great. So now we're leaving the session and yeah. we're getting into election season. Yes. Yes, we are. Yeah. So the fundraising can start. They've fun adjourned. Yeah. So in, in fact, there's going to be an event this Friday, correct? Yeah. Tell us a little bit about what's coming up. What is it? Shapapalooza uh, or something? Shap the Shappening. The Shappening. Um, yes. House Speaker Shap Smith, after eight years, is on his way out. He's uh, he's weighing a run for lieutenant governor. He was in the governor's race mm -hmm. last summer before pulling out in the fall. Um, when his wife was unfortunately uh, uh, battling breast cancer. Um, by all accounts, she's doing much better, and he is considering uh, not the governor's race, but the lieutenant governor's race. And uh, he may jump in yet. But first, uh, the Vermont Democratic Party is holding uh, a party and, and fundraiser for him at the Vermont College of Fine Arts on Friday mm -hmm. called The Shappening. Mm -hmm. And it will uh, be a celebration and fundraiser, uh, mm -hmm. basically, for the party. Now, I, I would imagine there will be nothing said of his pending, uh, perhaps pending, LG campaign, mm -hmm. uh, since that could raise some issues about uh, uh, in-kind contributions from the party to the campaign if, if it were to sort of be viewed as one thing. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll have to see how the, how the shopping goes. And maybe next week, we'll get an announcement from Shap Smith himself about what his plans are. And, and, and so Shap enter, if Shap enters the race, then he will be the third Democrat uh, yes. in, in, a, in a potential uh, yeah. primary where people are voting in August, correct? Right. Uh, Senator Dave Zuckerman, a progressive and Democrat, is in the race, as is uh, Keisha Rahm, a representative uh, from Burlington. Mm -hmm. And so it could be a three-way primary if he jumps in the race, but he brings with him a lot of uh, sort of institutional power from the Democratic Party and mm -hmm. uh, perhaps a, a a number of foot soldiers in the House who would work their districts for him mm -hmm. in both the primary and general election against uh, Randy Brock, the Republican mm -hmm. candidate. So uh, we have a lot to look forward to in the uh, in the election season. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that campaigns will begin ramping up now that they can uh, uh, focus, you know, entirely on, on this and, and not the legislative session. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Absolutely. And so we're going to have a real concrete idea of who's in the race and who's not in the race on May 26th, right? That's, yeah, that's, that's, state, the, that's the deadline? State races, I think, have to file by the 26th of May. Uh, mm -hmm. So we should have a good, good understanding of uh, where legislative seats might be headed and where these statewide seats are going. Um, you know, I, do, I don't expect a whole lot of any real surprises for the statewide races at this point. The only pending question right now seems to be if Shaft Smith gets in the race for lieutenant governor. Uh, but there will be a number of interesting uh, candidates for the House and Senate that we will uh, try to do our best to keep everyone updated on as after the filing deadline. Very good. Excellent. So Josh, it's been a fun session. Oh, yeah. Good work. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. And uh, we thank you for tuning in and watching us uh, discuss the week's progress during the session. And we'll be back next year on uh, Capital Beat, a joint project between the Vermont Press Bureau and Orca Media. Thanks again.